multiple times. So you will not be graded with your, um, how would I call them, staged or, or, um, or frequent commits or pushes to the repository. For example, assume you've developed something today, it's not complete, but you pushed because you are advised to push every time you do development of your code. This is not going to be marked for you. Like the only thing that is going to be, to, to be graded is after the deadline, the last commit you had, and GitHub has this history thing, as I said before, if, if it passes all the tests, that's perfect. You will be graded on that, even if previous commits didn't, uh, didn't pass. So don't worry about this. The second question is like in coming labs, are you going to be graded based on your code efficiency? Yes, some labs state this very clearly. You have to write your code in an efficient way. Some will say, oh, don't use some of these functions. You have to develop your own. So when there is a constraint, it will be stated very clearly in the lab question. Is there a way to join without checking avenue email every time? I guess you're talking about Zoom meetings. You don't need to. If, if you have these Zoom invitations into your calendar or like within Zoom itself, you add them to your Zoom meetings, you can just open Zoom. In fact, this is what I do. I just log in into my Zoom account. I find my meetings and then I join the meeting. So you don't need to check anything else other than Zoom or your calendar if you want. Okay. We still have maybe two minutes before we start. So if you have any other questions, go ahead. Are you going to post the tutorial? Yes, I'm going to post the tutorial, hopefully, if it goes okay. One thing to mention is in lecture one, it didn't record um, correctly by Zoom. So this is something also to put into your account is this is why I said it's better that you attend meetings because if, if a lecture didn't get like recorded correctly, which might happen as similar to what happened to lecture one. At least you didn't miss the lecture. What I have done instead is exactly the same content from last year lecture. I have posted added lecture one from past year into the the playlist. Hopefully this doesn't happen in the future. Each time I start, I am checking. So now we are really recording. So that's going on. But yeah, is the check performed on each push the same? same as the final assessment or do we have to try and account for additional cases? I'm not sure if I get this question, but the only thing you'll get marked on is your last push, if it works correctly. Don't worry about intermediate pushes. This is what happens in a professional code. You do development, you don't finish your problem at once, right? So it, it, for example, in coming labs, this was a very simple lab, but in coming labs, you have multiple questions, maybe 10 questions. I'm not expecting you to finish all questions in one sitting, and I'm also saying you need to push every time you said because this is a professional way of doing things. So you're not going to mark it in, in the intermediate pushes if, if your last push is okay. Could you explain the difference between a double and a float? We are coming to this, this lecture. So don't worry about this. Okay, so I guess it's time so I can start and, and as I frequently do, uh, it each milestone I can uh, I can check questions. Do you know what the result you get when you push? Um, in, in fact, you can run the tests locally. If you're under your execution, it, it, can, it, it, it will tell you whether you pass the tests or not. So this is a way for your code to, to check. And also when you push uh, in your GitHub, you have this like check mark as, as green or you have this red X, so it says you, 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 you didn't pass some of the tests. So you're able to check yourself. And this is one uh, advantage of having GitHub um, as and GitHub Classroom and unit testing as our environment, because you can see that what you passed and what you didn't pass before even getting your grade. Thank you. So let me start now. I hope you are able to see my slides. So similar to what we have done in the previous lecture, I want this to be also more hands-on. So we'll go through some examples explaining the concepts and then I will jump into online GDB and then uh, develop with you some of, some of the examples. And I will also f uh, frequently check questions when you guys have them. Okay, so I assume you are seeing my slides. If not, please let me know in the chat. So what we're going to cover today is more basics of C, how to define different uh, data types. For example, you had a question about float and double, uh, how to have some if conditions, for loops, 
uh, and some of the basics of any language, how do we do this in C? Let's, let's take this by an, by an example. Assume I want to read 10 integers from a user and out with the sum of these integers. So let's compare with Python because this is what you guys know. I define a main, I have a for loop that goes through a range of 10 numbers. Each time I ask the user to input, uh, please input an integer and this is part of the loop. So this will be kind of ask it for the user 10 times or, or generally the number of iterations you have in your loop. Each time the user inputted something, you add this to the sum. So you sum your, your 10 integers and then at the end, you want to bring the sum to the user, good? So something you can observe here is that the sum is only printed once, right? Because it's outside the loop, right? So one of the videos, if you don't get the loop concept or iteration concept in programming in general, uh, then watch some of the videos I, I, I posted as a revision for Python. But the main idea is you want to execute certain number of instructions multiple times, not just one time. For example, here, these two lines, X input, please input an integer and the sum. So let me do this. So these two lines are executed inside the loop. So they are executed number of iterations equal to the, to the number of iterations you have in your loop. In Python here, we specify this to be 10 times, right? On the other hand, because Brent is outside the loop, this is only printed once, right? Assume we want to do exactly the same thing in C. What do we want to do, right? So, uh, sir, sir, by the way, is sum def is sum defined? Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, yeah. so it's initialized. So okay, that's that's an excellent question. I guess we touched it on this last time. In Python, here I'm saying sum equals zero, so I'm initializing the value of sum. But in in Python, you don't really need to define the type of the sum, and this is one big difference between Python and C. C is a very strict language, as we will see right now. If you do a similar code like this and see it's not going to work because you didn't declare sum. You didn't say what is the type of the sum, right? In Python and, and some other interpreted languages, the sum or in general, the variable type get interpreted uh, implicitly by the way you use it. For example, here we are defining sum as equal zero and we are adding integers. So by default, Python will recognize that sum is an integer, right? This doesn't happen in C. You have to define the type as we will see now. But thank you for the question. Okay, so let's see what we can do in, um, in C. And in fact, let me jump into the online GDB to, to do this together, right? I, I don't want you to just sit and see things. Let's, let, let's see how this works, right? Um, have many open windows. Let me see where is online GDB here. Okay, let me, okay, this one. I hope you guys are able to see the online GDB, right? Okay, so what, what do you want to do? We want to do exactly the same thing. So let's take it step by step, right? As I said, you need to do multiple things. You need to ask the user to input integer, but you need to do this 10 times. So it has to be through a loop to be efficient. And then you need to sum every time you sum it. So you need a sum variable. In C, you cannot use sum without declaring it as I said. So these are integers, so the sum will be integer. So I'm defining sum to be end, right? Good. And then I want to do a loop. So what I do is for end i, and then let's say, I'm just saying end i equals zero here. And then I'm using, oh, that's bad or just int i if you wish, then i starting from zero, then i less than the number I want. So here it's 10 and then i plus plus. So what is this? So take, take, take it step by step. What I have done is I declare two variables. We have done this uh, in the previous lecture, both are int. We will come into different types later in lecture, but here this is the type you want to define and this is the, vari the variable name, right? 
both are integers because we are dealing with integers. And then this is your iteration index or iteration variable. This is the one that is going to let you know your counter of the iterations, right? This is the one that you will iterate through. So it starts from zero up to 10. We say it's less than 10 because you need 10 times. So it's zero, one, two, three, up to nine, right? And then I plus plus is, you just say increase I by one and we will come into what plus plus mean. Mean, if, if you are confused, you can just say, okay, I equal I plus one, if you wish, right? So you increase I by one each time, right? And then you want to open these brackets for, for any block of code, including uh, four or if conditions in C. Inside the loop, what we want to do inside the loop, I want to do two steps. Tell the user to input something and take this input to a variable. We have done this last time. This is the part of the code we are building on from previous time. So if you remember, how did we read something from the screen? It was a scan F function, right? But before the scan if I want to instruct the user to input something. So we need the printf. So printf, then please input an integer And then I would say, I want this to be in a new line after each time it's to be a new line, right? And then I want to read this integer into a variable. And then because this is an int, so it has to be this specifier, if you remember from last time. Oh, now came something. Where should I place this, right? I don't have a variable to place my input from the user in. So we need to define a third one, right? Maybe I call it input if you wish, right? Or let's see if input is a server word, but let's call it input. And then now I'm modifying my input, right? So input will hold in each iteration, the variable or the value that the user entered, right? Now, what is the next step? The next step is you want to add this input to your sum, right? So I can say sum equal the previous sum plus input, correct? And then at the end, after adding everything, this is going to be repeated 10 times. You want to display the sum to the user. So you want to do a print F, then the sum of the integer values is something like this. Then I want to display a variable. Here comes the specifiers or the placeholders. I'm displaying a, an integer and then this should be my sum, correct? Good, so I'll stop here and ask one question. But, but before asking the question, let me see if you guys have any comments on, on the chat. So you could in Java and Bison, what do you need to initialize? Okay, that's a perfect, can you also some symbol scan? What symbol is in the scan F before input? This is from previous lecture, so I'm not asking, is there any difference between A plus equal? We will come into the meaning of this A plus thing. So don't worry about this for now. Ah, yes, that's correct, thank you. If, if I remember, yeah, that's correct because you're reading a single value, you can read multiple ones. Okay. Uh, why is there a bracket after the or stat? That's not clear, I guess. So there was, there, I was going to ask something, but someone already asked it. Do I need to initialize sum to zero? And that's a very, very important question in, in C, right? By doing this, so, so focus with me on this because this is important to understand. You are declaring a variable, right? Declaring a variable of int, int is 32 bytes and we'll come into different like data types now, but an integer is just 32, uh, sorry, 32 bits, so it's four bytes. So you put a place in the memory and you declare it to be your sum, right? The problem is, the memory might hold any garbage from previous operations. This is memory shared with all processes. So the place you reserve it for, for some might already include some pre-value that you don't need in your program that is from other programs. It's a garbage, right? So without initializing some, 
if you later use sum, you might come up with a wrong value because some might hold already something, right, from previous programs. So you need to, in, 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 in C, as a common brax, initialize all your variables to a value you, you want. If you don't have a specific initialization value, make it zero. Okay? That's, that's a good question. So let's, let's run this to see what's, what's going on. So please input an integer. I input something, input another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then nine, and then it gives me the sum, right? So that's perfect. Good. One question is, can I do this uh, program without writing a loop? What is, what is the most naive way of, the, of, of writing this code, right? Just to think of what it, loop iterations means for you. What is a full loop? The most naive way is you just repeat this code 10 times, right? The number of iterations you would have, right? In fact, your compiler will do this for you, right? It will do what we call loop unrolling, which is look into the code, find the loops, and then repeat the number of iterations you have. Right? So if you are writing a code, if you, don't, if you don't know loops, for example, assume you are like, you didn't get introduced to programming at all before. You don't know that you have this loop capability. What, I, what you can do if you are asked to try this program is to repeat these statements 10 times. But as you can imagine, your program become very large. It's inefficient way of writing code and it's going to take you more time to write it and to debug it, right? So loops, what it does simply is just see what code is repeated and enclose it into these iterations, right? Good. So another question is, can I write it in a different way, not repeating this code 10 times? So I write it in a different way, but without using loops. Scan 10 times, scan F 10 times, this is what I said, this is a naive way but I'm looking for a different way. Can a scan if take multiple values separated by white space? Exactly, this is what we're looking for. So we can utilize scan if. No one said that scan if is taking a single input. And this is a beautiful thing about scan if, right? So another way of writing this code is I'm going to remove the four. I'm going to tell the user, please input not an integer, input 10 integers and maybe separated by space. And then I would say, instead of doing this, I'm going to read, these are three. So we have now nine and then D. And then instead of doing this, the problem now is you need to define 10 inputs, right? So you can write input one, up to, oh, okay, uh, this is not the right way of writing code, but I'm telling you that you need to define input one, input two, and then you go up to input nine, right? So you can do that, uh, sorry, input 10, and then you can write them. So, okay, maybe we just simplify it by three, right? And then input three, and then now it will be input one and input two and input three and then now sum will be sum plus input one in fact we don't even need some plus because it will be just zero but it doesn't matter then input two input three right so what i have done oh now this should be only three so what i have done is scan if can take multiple inputs in a certain format and you put the format here right so and you are guiding the user to input them in the format you want right and then if, if you want to run this now, I get the message of please input integers, three integers separated by space. I would write one, two, three, and then the sum is six, right? So you can take multiple inputs to scan if, and, and this, in, in this case, you don't need the loop, right? So let's go back to the loop case because I, I want to discuss something more with you. Okay, so 
for loop is one example of loop iteration in any programming language, but there are some others, right? So you guys might be aware of that there is also while loop. I can do exactly the same program using while loops instead of for loops, right? So what is the main difference between while loops and for loops? In for, so one general rule at the beginning, any code that you can write using a for loop, you can get an completely equivalent functionality using while loop and the other way around. So for and while, they can replace each other completely, right? So they are equivalent. But the second thing, so after knowing this, this is very important to know. After knowing this, there are some kind of more convenient use cases for for versus while. So there are cases where you spot them all. Oh, for is more convenient here. It doesn't mean while is incorrect, but for is more suitable and while the other way around. What are these cases, right? Four is more convenient if you have specific number of iterations. For example, you know it's 10, right? So you can just write your full iterations in, in just one statement. While on the other hand is more convenient if you don't have a specific number of iterations, but you have a condition. What does it mean? For example, you want to keep in your while until a certain value of the sum arises. For example, you say, keep summing up until sum reaches certain value, 70, right? This makes sense? So while is more suitable if you have a specific condition that is not in number of iterations, four is more convenient if you have specific number of iterations, good? So let me look into the chat, Let's see. Okay, so I guess all the questions are either repeated or about YouTube channel or something, or, or they are asking about questions that might be from the previous lecture. So for example, what is this and thing, right? So again, the main thing you want to understand from this is this and is allowing the scanf to modify the value of input, right? Otherwise, input will not be modified. And we will touch on this later when we talk about functions, good? Okay, so let's let's try to do exactly the same example using while loop, right? So what you can do instead is, uh, maybe I can comment this line, but I don't want to confuse you, but maybe it's better to see both together. So I am commenting the four. Now I want to define this using while. So first of all, while takes a condition in C, right? To do this, what is the condition? My condition now is I less than 10, right? but I didn't have an initial value. So you need to initialize I here before while. And then you open the brackets. So in four, the increase of I was done throughout the definition of the four block, but at while you need to do this inside the while itself. So you need to say I equal I plus one. And then, oh, it should be one. And then here I'm closing the while. So let's look into this code together. And, and this is again a revision of the difference between for and while. Hopefully this is not new information for you. So we kind of replaced one line of the for loop with three lines for while. The first line is initializing your iteration. The second line includes the condition. So I equals zero. As far as I is less than 10, keep doing this loop. And inside the loop, the third line is increasing your iteration counter by one. Good. So this is how you replace for with while. As you can see here, this is a typical example of why for is more suitable for number of iterations because while is not very compact, right? It still does the function for you, but the condition is already clear from the iteration. So maybe for is more convenient, right? Can you explain why we had to initialize sum to zero before? Okay, yeah, I guess this is something I can re explain because it's important. So. Oh, I still need to initialize it to zero. I, I didn't do it that here. Oh, you have to do this. You can either do this like this or like this. Sum equal zero. Maybe you do this here. So why? Because so in your memory, by by just declaring a variable here, this this line, you are saying you are telling the hardware reserve to me a place in the memory of type int, 
int is generally 32 bits, which is four bytes. So you reserve four bytes in your memory, but the memory is shared with everyone. So these four bytes might include some garbage value from previously, right? From any other program or so when the memory get freed, it, it might include some brief value that you don't want, right? If you don't initialize some and you use it, here we are adding some to itself with the input. The initial value of some can be anything, a thousand, for example, right? Because you didn't initialize it. That means now you, you don't only add the inputs, but you also add to it the previous value that this sum variable or the memory place was holding before, which is incorrect. So you, to guard yourself against any brief value or any garbage value that exists in the memory, you have to initialize your variable. Okay, okay an excellent question. So I'm initializing I. So the question is, if you initialize some, why you don't initialize I and input? Great, you can if you want. And in fact, I advise you to have this as a common practice, but I is initialized here, so we already initialize it. Even for four, we already initialize it. So it takes an initial value. For input, we really didn't do this because you directly read something from the, from the user. So you don't use input until you modify it, right? So any previous value that exists in input, assume input here when defined, input was holding this garbage value from the memory that was, I don't know, like 2000, right? And you never use this value. Why? Because I already modify input here by reading from the user. So this get overwritten before used. So it's safe. But as I said, a common good practice is initialize everything, right? Even if you know, because when programs get bigger, you don't know when you are going to use a variable, whether you're going to write into it first or read from it first, right? Thank you. Okay, so let's go back to the slides and, and see uh, the other things we have. Okay, so this goes through all what I mentioned one by one. So we have already covered this. Sum is initialized, we add the body, we, we read that in integers, great. And then we display the sum. So now let's add some other interesting things, which is uh, assume I want to modify my code a little bit such that I read 10 integers from the user but I output only the sum of the odd values, right? That's interesting, right? So now we just don't add everything. We add the sum of the input value if it's only an odd number, right? And let me be, go back to the four, because it might be more convenient to, to focus on the condition we have. And now I need to initialize the sum to be zero. So again, what we want to achieve, we want here, we add everything the user inputs, the 10 values. But now I want to add an extra condition, which is only add the input value to the sum if the input is odd, right? Can you think of what might this represent in programming? So you have a condition, right? So now you, you do things conditionally. You, you just don't add by default. So what you want to do is you need to check your input condition, your, your, your condition on the input before you add it. And here comes the if condition, right? So we do an if. How do I check whether a value is odd or even by just doing a modulus with two? So you say if input mod two is zero equal to zero. And we're going to explain all of this right now. You, oh, I wanted to add the sum. Right, so I would say if it wasn't zero, which means it's odd, right? This is your odd number, odd case, you add. What do I do for the even, right? I just don't do anything. You don't need to do anything now, right? So it's only an if condition. If your input is odd, which means it's mod with two is not zero, you just sum it to the sum. Otherwise you don't do anything. Does this make sense? So let's, Let's check that, right? But I guess it's it's going to be easy and it's going to take some time, right? So it, it doesn't really ma matter to, to, to run it, but I want you to first to understand that. So if it's, if it's odd, I'm adding an if condition. So let's explain what is this if condition. So if in C is written like this, you have an F, which is a reserved word, and then you have a condition in uh, parentheses or brackets. What is the condition? 
you have a right side of the condition and the left side of the condition. Here we are saying if input mode two, mode is a math operation. So here input mode two would represent some value. If this value is not equal to zero, which means you are odd, otherwise you are even. Another way to write this for yourself is to say, I define another variable that I call is odd, for example, right? And I would say, or maybe not is odd because it's, it's a mess uh, representing name. So I would say mod, I call it mod two, right? Because it will only hold the input mod two operation. And then here, I only say mod, if mod two is not equal to zero, then it's odd. So now we separated the condition into two lines. The first line is just holding the mod operation and then checking whether this is equal to zero or not, right? This is an if condition. Another way that to check the even, I can say, okay, else this is just an, uh, an additional feature to show you how else works. I can say Brent, if I just tell the user that a certain input, so I would say input, then D is even, so not added, something like this. And then here, this should be this input, just to show you how the else works. So let's, let's explain this. So what I'm doing is I reading the input, I'm reading the input value, I'm checking, by dividing or by, by, by doing the mode operation with two. And then if it's odd, I'm adding it, great. If it's even, I'm not doing anything, I'm not updating the sum, but as a convenient message, I'm telling the user, your input is even, so I'm not adding it, good? So it's F else statement, this makes sense? Let me see if there is any question. Yeah, the mode operation, okay, maybe I, I, I thought you get this by default. The mode operation is only giving you the reminder of the operation. So if input is seven, you do seven by two, so you divide it, and then you see what is the reminder, it's one. So this is the mode operation, basically. It takes the reminder of the division, right? So I guess, uh, I just assume it's basic math, but maybe I, I, you guys get confused with this, with this sign. So this is how you do a mod in, 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 in C. So going back, so, so we have done this. So I'm scanning, I'm adding the F condition here. So the only thing we change it is just adding the F condition to check whether it's a zero or not. I only add if it's zero, good. So let's, let's have another example. So read integers input by user until the first one and until the first one and output their sum. The sum shouldn't include the first one. What does it mean? So. I keep reading inputs from the user and I check the value. If the value is one, I stop and print the sum. Otherwise it continues. So I'm using the one value as my own termination code, right? If the user is inputting one, that means please terminate, right? Why this example is interesting, right? So let's go back here. Remember when I told you that four is more interesting if you have specific number of iterations while while is more interesting if you have a specific condition now it seems that we have a specific condition on the inputs right we don't have a specific number of iterations i don't know how many times i'm going to read from the input until i reach one it can the user can input one in the first time or it can input one after a thousand times right so there is no specific number of iterations that means now while is more convenient right so what i can do is i say while, and then I have a certain condition, and I would say while input is not equal to one, right? That means now I keep reading until the input is not equal to one. So if input is not equal to one, what I can do is, but maybe now I initialize the input to be zero as well, because now I am reading input. So initialization comes in, and then please input an integer or one to terminate. So I'm again informing the user that if you want to terminate, please input one. Scanning input. Now I change my condition a little bit, which is if input equal, oh, shouldn't, does not equal one, 
So I just add. Otherwise, maybe I would say terminating, right? Something like this. Let's, let, let's examine this code together. What I want to achieve, I want to keep asking the user to input some values. And each time I'm checking the value, if the value is one, I'm terminating. Otherwise, I'm presenting the sum of all the previous values. So each time I need to keep track, I only update the sum if the value is not one. Otherwise, I terminate. Does this make sense? Let me see your questions here. That's a perfect question. So you guys are ahead of that. But I, I'll come in to do why now, but I thank you for the question. Oh, so th this was a previous question. So is there a benefit of doing the mod outside the if statement versus having it as part of the condition? There is no benefit at all. It's just for convenience. I wanted to break down two operations to you to see how things happening, but it might be more convenient if you get more experience that you just have the same, everything in, in, in the same if condition bucket, right? But both are equivalent. So now the question that, that, that is here is, could you use the while, uh, So could you could you use do while to, to, to do that? So in fact, do while is even more convenient, but I'll explain to you what do while means now. But there was a, a question afterwards that is convenient to this step, which is, will you ever reach the else statement if your input is, uh, is one? So let's think about this, right? I guess this question is coming from the fact that we are checking initially if the input is not one, right? Correct? So that means if it's one, you don't come inside, right? So you might say, oh, I will never reach the else statement because the input will never be one inside the while loop, right? But that's not correct. Can someone think why this is not correct? Why you might reach the else, even if you have this condition here? Exactly, because scan is inside, right? So I'm updating the input here. This input value is from the previous iteration, but see that, right? I'm reading, so I'm asking him to print something and I'm having the scan if, so I'm updating the input. So inside, assume that the previous value of input was two. Great, I check, input is two, so that's fine. Then I'm asking, but this was the previous value. Then I'm asking him to enter another value. He enters one, now input is one but you are inside the while, right? So, so you, because you update the input here inside the while loop, this condition is from the previous iteration, right? And this is in fact, might mean that we can rewrite, restructure the code in a better way, right? One of these ways is to use a do while, right? What is do while? So what is the difference between while and do while? So in while, you only execute your, it, loop body if your condition is met, satisfied, right? So you never come here unless your input is not one. But what if there are cases where you might want to execute at least once, right? Because at least you want to ask your user to input something, right? Initially, here we, we are forcing this because our input is zero. So you might not, do, the, the main question was, we can get rid of the initialization of input if we use do while, right? But before, before showing you how do while works, like I, I want to see if you guys get this and if you have any question. Could the local value input change the global value input? Break will end the while loop. Okay. So that's also a good question that we didn't address yet. So he's saying, here I have input inside, input outside. Are these two different variables or one variable, right? And this is related to a topic in programming called variable scope, right? If we define, and this take as a general rule until we touch this topic in details. If you are defining a variable in your main, the scope of this variable is the whole main and everything inside. Right? So input is visible here, is visible here. It's exactly the same memory space. So it's exactly the same variable. There are, no, there, there are no two variables. It's only a single one, right? Because we didn't define input twice. We only defined it once. So you have a single memory space 
that is holding the values in, of input and it gets reflected everywhere in the main, right? So we'll come into what we mean by global variables, local variables, variables within blocks. So don't worry too much about this now, but generally what you need to understand is input has a single vision, a global vision within the main of its value. Okay. Good, so let's jump back to the slides. Okay, so as I said, we don't know how many integers, so we don't have a specific number of iterations, so it's better to use the while loop, right? So as I said, why the, so why the current number is not one, you want to add the number to the sum. This is how you think of the algorithm. Remember lecture zero, when I told you before, uh, you start coding, you want to think of what you want to achieve, right? So inside the loop, you want to add the number and then read the next integer. And then after exiting the loop, you just print the sum, good? But you need to initialize the sum to zero as, as we said. This is, this is exactly just what we wrote, right? So one thing that we are doing here differently, so I, I told you that this, the code that we had in the OpenGDB might not be very efficient because we only read the input inside the loop, right? We are sure that we are going to at least read it one because we initialized our num or iteration to be zero, right? So at least you, go, you are going inside this one. But if we didn't initialize, you want at least to read once, right? So in order not to get confused, let me look into what we have wrote, right? Here, I'm initializing input to be zero, which means I am sure that this condition is true at least in the first time, right? This is why I'm sure at least I'm going to read a single input from the user. But if you didn't initialize that, you are not really sure whether you're going to even go inside or not because input might hold the one from previous iterations or previous values, right? Any garbage. So something you can do instead is you can at least say, I'm going to read an input in the first time, right? And then based on this first input from the user, I'm going to go inside the loop, right? And then now you don't do this because you want first to check before you add things up, right? This is not even anymore. It is one, right? So what did I change as a structure here? And it's another way of writing the code. I would say, at least I'm reading once from the user. And then if the user inputted one, then this loop will not get executed at all. So the sum will be zero. But if the user inputted something other than one, I'm going to go inside, check the input value that I read. If it's not one, I add it. Otherwise I terminate. But in fact, now in the first iteration, this well, will never happen in the first situation because you are sure that you are not one. And then you ask him again to keep inputting things, right? And every time you check, great. This is another way of writing the code. One problem with this code is you have two lines of code repeated twice, right? Which you might not need. And this is why some of you already mentioned the do while. Here comes the do while. So now we have three types of loops. Four, which is more suitable for iterations, while, which is more suitable for conditions, and then a specific or a special version of while, which is called do while. The only difference is do is allowing you to execute your code at least once, which what, what, what we're doing here, before checking your condition. So how to do this, right? But let's, let me first take questions before jumping into do while. Why is there is no and in the front of the sum in line 21? Okay, I will come into this. How does it update the variable without it? Okay, in the line in the else sustain, how come you don't use a placeholder? Do you need a return for every function in C? Okay. Okay, that's, these are excellent questions. The first and easiest one is, and I guess we said this in the first lecture, no, you don't need a return for every single function. You only need to return if there is an expected return type here because main is expecting to return end 
we have returned zero, right? But if you have void here, which means you're not expecting to return anything, then you don't need a return state. Then the second question is, how do you don't have an and for the sum here and you are modifying the sum? A sum is a variable within a function, which is the mean, right? You are free to modify all the variables within your function. You only need the and if you are passing your input parameter to another function that you want it to be able to modify. So the and is only needed if or when you are passing parameters to a function. Scan if is another function, which is implemented somewhere else. As we said, it's implemented inside the studio.h. It takes input parameters. If you pass input without the and, input will not change in the main. It will have its own value, right? It's, this is something you can try on your own. You can define input to be zero, for example, and then pass it to the scan if without and, then print what you, see as input in the mean. You will not see input is changing. It will remain zero, even if the user input is something else. The reason is it's modified inside the scan f, but it's not reflecting the modification in the mean. This is a topic that if you don't get, don't worry, because we are touching on this in, 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 in detail later when we talk about functions, right? So there is no worry about this now. But the main question is sum. Sum is not passed to a function at all, so you are free to modify as, as you wish, right? There is no worry, you don't, you don't need the and here. And is only used when you are passing parameters to a function. Okay, I guess someone is saying why you are not having a specifier in the scan. We have here, right? You can, you can do this if you wish, it's more safe. Uh, the same thing here. So you already have the specifier or the placeholder for the scan F, for the scan F and for the print F. So we already do that, right? Okay, so I will do the do while and then re revisit the questions again. Again, do while is beneficial if you want to execute your iterations, your loop body at least once, which what we are doing here anyway, right? So what you can do is you say do instead of while. So I just do this, do, and then here while and your condition, right? And then you remove this and then you take this at the beginning. Don't worry about all what I'm saying. I'm going to explain all of this now, right? So let's see what this piece of code doing, right? First of all, do while, like while, like for, all are equivalent. So you can do exactly the same program as we have even experienced ourselves right now using all the three, three versions. But there are more suitable versions than others, right? And this is what the example is showing is if you want to execute at least once, which means you want to read at least from the user once, instead of repeating your code, like what we have done for a while, you can do this through do while. So what do is doing is saying, execute this once, then go ahead and check the condition. If the condition is not met, don't repeat, but if it's met, keep repeating, right? So what do we do? In the first iteration, we read from the user, and then we check if it's not one way sum, otherwise, we just don't do anything or we terminate or in fact, you don't, you don't even need this if you don't wish, right? It's just for convenience. And then you go here after the first iteration and you check your condition. Then if your condition, if, if previously you were in one, then you go back and reread, right? And do the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. Good. So do is allowing you to execute this code at least once before checking the condition. Good. Okay, so let's go back to our slides to see uh, slideshow. Okay, perfect. So yeah, this this is the le less efficient way of doing things by while because we repeat some of the code, right? Okay, so now let me pick some questions before I move forward to the one to end. So that's the example. Can you use anything else or other than example? For sure. I mean, this is something, it's just as an example, right? One is used here as an example. Whatever value you put, for example, negative one, a thousand, whatever value you tell the user to, term, to enter to terminate, then you can use as a, as a condition, right? This is just shown as an example, right? Okay, so now let's move a little bit. How much time we have remaining? Let me see. Okay. So in, in, in um, 
don't worry too much. We're going to continue these examples in, in the coming lecture, right? Now, like these slides are for two lectures. So we are going to read 15 floating point numbers. Now we move into floating point numbers and uh, inputted by the user and then bring them in the reverse order. So utilizing a little bit what we have used so far, but introducing more things like floating point types, how to bring things in reverse order. It's not just a sum. So how to do these things. I guess we will not have time to touch on this example. So maybe I'll, I'd better take questions in the remaining time and then we'll start from it in the next time. Using a stack, you guys are amazing. So, but, but, but this is an advanced topic, but we, yes, we will come into how to do this, right? Uh, let me example to know why do you need the if statement here? I need the if statement to check the condition because I guess you are referring to all the questions will be to the code. So let me look into the code. So you need to check this condition because you don't want to add unless the input is not one. Again, you might imagine that because I have this code here, I will not reach the if condition at all, but that's not correct because you read something inside the loop. So the thing that you read now inside your loop might be in fact one, and you don't want to add it, right? So it's still needed. Queues, stacks, wait about this for now, right? Okay, is there any other question related to what we have done? So just to wrap up what we have done today, right? So we looked into uh, some iterations like for, while, do, while. We look into if conditions and we, we looked into how to build a little bit more on Brent F and scan F to read things from the user, add them. All what we have been doing right now is only for integer variables in Berbus. Next time we'll start introducing for, by examples more types and and uh, and and more advanced conditions uh, and more data structures like you guys are mentioning Q stacks that's advanced maybe arrays is another example. Okay, maybe this is a, a quick question related to this. Uh, what is the syntax for an F if else statement? We didn't touch if else yet, so don't worry about this. Like examples will come about if else, but the 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 structure of f and, and this f else is you have an f here and then the condition and then the body of the f which only executes if this condition is correct. You can have f alone similar to the example we had at the very beginning or you can have an else statement which says if f is not satisfied then this body is only executed if the condition is false, right? So if body is executed is if the condition is, is true and the else is executed if the condition is false, right? You put the condition between brackets and then you put the body. Everything should be within brackets, right? Then the second question is, why do while is more convenient here? Because previously in the while example, we repeated these two lines together like to, twice. One before the loop, because we wanted to read at least once from the user before jumping into the while, right? But this is exactly the function of a do while, which says I can execute my code body at least once and then check the condition, right? This is what made do while more efficient because it saved you from repeating some of the code lines. Why my program always output two times, but I only input one time? I'm not sure if I get that. Okay, so um, so by this we, we conclude and let's continue in um, in in, uh, in the next lecture for for the more examples with other data types and, and and maybe a little bit more of like data structures. Thank you so much and and talk to you on um, Tuesday. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. You too.